make it out if you want to get here. But if not, again, we're so glad to be together. We are full of anticipation out here. Sun is on its way up. We are getting ready to celebrate. And we're so excited to be able to do this together and uh, sharing our time. We've got people coming in from all over and uh, just really excited. You can see the crowds that have gathered, and we are about to celebrate what God is doing here. So looking forward to being able to do that with you and just uh, want to invite you. Really engage today, sing along, uh, enjoy the service, and let's celebrate what God has done. Uh, you know, you think back to the to the actual day that this happened back in Jerusalem and what everybody was experiencing in that moment. You know, we're excited. We're full of anticipation. But in that moment, they were coming out of an experience where they were had lost hope. They had lost all hope of of anything happening and maybe you're coming into today and and you're kind of in that space where you uh don't have you've lost some hope or the the reality of life has settled in uh but we want to just remind you today that christ is risen he's alive and we're excited to celebrate that today so easter sunrise we're getting ready just a couple more minutes and we're going to launch this thing and celebrate together so we're so glad you're with us today. God bless you, and we look forward to celebrating. Let's celebrate Jesus today. Amen. Good. I don't know where the, when the light went, went off, I was like, I don't know.
with men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. He is risen. Let us worship together. Somebody shout for Jesus. Let me hear you. Come on, raise up a sound. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. If you're in love with Jesus, it'll warm the place up. Woo! I see you rising, and I see you getting warmer. Splendor of the King, clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide. They tremble at his voice. Tremble at his voice. Let's raise it up. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. Yeah. How great. Is our God sing with me? How great is our God? Oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. Yeah. Age to age he stands and dark. Lion and man, he wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide. Trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. Let's sing it out. How great.
Welcome to the Easter sunrise at the Lincoln Memorial. Where are our first timers? First timers. Yeah. And where are our old timers? <laughs> and then where, where are my still waking uppers? Oh, welcome. What a beautiful morning. We're going to continue to worship the Lord. In 1979, some of you weren't even born yet. In 1979, Pastor Amos Dodge was praying on the National Mall, and he had a thought that he thought was a thought, but it was a voice. Why not celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ at the Lincoln Memorial. Can I just say, on behalf of all of us, thank you to Pastor Amos and Sue Dodge for obeying that prompting. And thank you for long obedience in the same direction. We drink from wells we did not dig. We live in houses we did not build. And so, it would not be Easter sunrise without an Easter declaration from Pastor Amos Dodge. Would you welcome him as he comes? Well, already, Pastor Mark, we're off to a bad start. You start talking about old timers just a moment ago. <laughs> well, happy Easter. Oh, my goodness, you're looking so wonderful today. Um, as you know, you've watched television enough. If you've never been in the Senate chambers that just down the road at the other end of the mall, they'll have a senator speaking, and uh, then at, he's given a certain amount of time. If he has time left over, he will say, I yield my time to the distinguished senator from. And so this is transition uh, Easter Sunday. We're making a great transition from Capitol Church uh, stewarding, hosting to National Community Church and Mark Batterson. So, Mark, in just a few minutes, I'm going to yield my time to the great pastor. Oh, there he is, right? The great pastor from National Community Church. You may be seated. Here's the good news from the graveyard. I say this sentence every time. The good news from the graveyard is Jesus Christ is risen Okay, we've got some first-timers, don't know you're supposed to respond. Uh, so, Christ is risen! Okay. On Easter Sunday, April 15th, 1979, 127 people gathered just behind me on the steps of the reflecting pool to celebrate the resurrection. The first Easter sunrise was A.D. 33, when Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and then the Bible says other women went to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus. When they got there, they discovered that the stone had been rolled away by the angel as was declared when we began our service today. They were wondering, what's going on here? Is it something mysterious has happened? And then they realized once they saw the angel that something miraculous was happening there and I believe this morning there will be some miraculous things here because we've come to celebrate the risen Lord he is risen it's my 43rd time to give this Easter declaration and I want to tell you that when they met that day at sunrise to, to just go anoint his body and suddenly discovered he's not there they had to make a decision and then the angel made a declaration to them that Christ wasn't there. He had risen as he said and promised that he would. They arrived at that tomb at Easter's dawn. They saw that stone had been rolled away. Or was it really, was it really miraculous? Did Jesus really rise again? They had to ask themselves that question. I think there will be some today who are here to ask themselves that question. And I'm sure today that as he did to them that day, he'll reveal himself. You'll feel his presence. You'll hear his voice. There'll be something that happens in the heart on this Easter Sunday. Crucified between two thieves on Friday, Sunday morning, Jesus came back from the dead. 
in a resurrection that rocked the world. The massive stone was rolled away from the entrance, and they, but it wasn't to let Jesus out. It was to let us see in that he is not here. He's gone. He's risen. No other religion has a virgin's womb and an empty tomb. Two miracles that are mighty, mighty, unexplainable, and miraculous. The virgin's womb, how can you be? There's just no way. And the empty tomb, how can you rise again on the third day? Today we don't follow a leader who was alive and is now dead. We worship a Savior who was dead and he is alive. Every religion has a tomb. Some are vine covered, some are elaborate, some are marble. Some have eternal flames, some have perpetual caretakers, but they all have no vacancy signs. All have occupants except the one in Jerusalem. I've been there. It's empty. The stone has been rolled away. To everyone who comes today, I believe you'll hear the voice of Jesus to you as Mary did that day. I don't know what he'll say to you, but I believe he'll speak to you today because he's alive. He's the one who caused the lame to walk, the blind to see, cleansed the leper, turned water to wine, fed 5,000. You can go on and on. I love the one line that he said to the woman who had been sinning, go and sin no more. And to all of us who have sinned, including this preacher, today you'll hear him say, Go and sin no more. From today, you're going to see and hear things differently. Today around the world, in the great cathedrals, stained glass windows, mud huts with dirt, dirt floors, or bombed out churches in the hurricane, there's gatherings great and small, whether whispered in silence in underground churches or shouted in praise. Two and a half billion followers of Jesus today will declare he's risen. It's the, one of the most verifiable facts of history. Forty days following the resurrection, Jesus appeared to more than 515 different people. He talked with people, ate with people, walked with people, and showed him that he was alive. 515 eyewitnesses to the resurrection in those 40 days. If you came today, as a man did several years ago, sent me an email afterwards, he was hoping for a politically correct, theologically tolerant, all-inclusive service where everybody's right and nobody's wrong and all roads lead to heaven, then you've come to the wrong place and you came on the wrong Sunday, I can assure you of that. All roads don't go to New York and all roads don't go to heaven. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and he, no one comes to the Father except by me. Oh, so Pastor Amos, you're not inclusive? No, we're very inclusive. We echo the words of Jesus, whosoever will may come. So bring him your faith, bring him your doubts, bring him your fears. This Easter, I want to declare it again to you, Christ is risen. Amen. It's great. It's great to see everyone today. My name's Joel Schmidgo. We're going to do something fun today, okay? We're going to get a picture of everybody's good-looking face. And so we've got a photographer, I think, that we're going to have come. And uh, here's what's going to happen. Um, we're all going to get in this. Now, if you go to your program, you'll see a QR code in your program. If you go to that and you scan it with your phone... What happens then is it'll pull up, you can put your information in there, and then we will send you a digital copy of this photo, okay? So we're all going to get our good-looking faces on. Hey, I want you to smile like it's 11.30 a.m. in the morning, okay? I want you to smile like you had a double shot this morning. I want you to smile like Starbucks was open before you showed up. That's what kind of smile we're going to give today. 
So I'm just looking around. I think we got a photographer. He's, we, can, we can stand. We can stand. Can we do that? How about we're going to stand up? All right, we're working it. Oh, look. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Okay, guys. Come on. Be careful. Don't hurt yourself. All right, here we go, y'all. Are we ready? Look, we got the thumbs up. It's happening. Hey, you can grab a seat. And I want to uh, invite some of our friends forward at this time. And we're going to take just a moment of prayer before we go back into worship today. So it's my honor. I'm inviting Jerry Woods and Doug Fears up here. And Jerry is the morning host at WGTS. Many of you might, have, might hear them all during your week. And Rear Admiral Doug Fears served 40 years in the U.S. Coast Guard and is a part of our church community. And so they're going to lead us in prayer. We're going to join our hearts together. Can we bow our heads? Father God, we are gathered here in this capital city, and we praise you that we can be here this morning. We praise you that you woke us up. It was early, but we are here, Father, and we are here to celebrate you, not just today, but every day. We celebrate what you did on this day. And so, Father, this morning, I pray for this city. It is a mighty and powerful city, but it is nothing in your presence, Father. We humble ourselves. You say that if we humble ourselves before you, we will be lifted up. So we bring this city to you, Lord. And we, we plead for your Holy Spirit. We pray, Lord, that your presence would come down over our, our, our leaders, over our city, over, over the homeless in this city, over those who make decisions, Lord. We humble our hearts. We give them to you. We give Washington, D.C. to you, Lord, every single heart here. Lord, when we go back to our homes, to our jobs, wherever we're headed, may people know that we have spent time with you. May it be more than just a day on the calendar. May it be in our hearts each and every single day. Father, we praise you for this Easter. We thank you that you are risen. We thank you that you are God of this city, that you are God of every city. Father, we pray for the day that you return soon and establish the new Jerusalem, your eternal kingdom. And when you do, Father, may we be ready for Jesus' sake. Amen. All right, let us pray. Almighty Father, we humbly bow before your throne this morning, full of gratitude and hope as we celebrate you on this resurrection day. We are grateful for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to teach us the way, a living sacrifice for the sins of all mankind. We are further grateful that as our good shepherd, you love and know each and every one of us with an intimacy that is staggeringly personal. We are also grateful to live in the United States, a country founded on biblical principles and virtue. Lord, we lift up our leaders, all of our leaders in government, the military, business, your church, and our communities. Your word is abundantly clear that if we ask for wisdom, you are certain to grant it to us. So we pray for our leaders that you grant them wisdom in all that they do. We also pray that you grant them the courage to always do what is right. Lord, we also pray for our world, for world leaders, for those fulfilling the Great Commission on the mission field, and particularly for those being persecuted for their faith in you. Lord, grant them an extra measure of your mercy and grace, as you also grant them strength and courage. We lift a special prayer up for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. We pray that this war and its devastating impact draws more people to a saving knowledge of you, the only true hope. So let us look forward fearlessly with absolute confidence and eager anticipation to seeing your kingdom fulfilled as you have promised. Please use us every day to be your salt and light in your son Jesus' precious holy name in whom there is always both hope and promise. Amen. Let's rise to our feet and we're going to praise the name of
of our great King. Somebody shout, Jesus!
Praise it up, say way, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh, 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 oh. maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Can we sing about the cross of Christ now? 
Is anybody excited about the redemption and the resurrection power of Jesus? <laughs> the song says, Hallelujah. You have won the victory. Best line. Death could not hold you down. You are the return king. Seated in majesty. You are the return king. Grace, he said, Our God is. He's alive. He won the victory. And he reigns on high. We say, Our God is. He's alive. Oh. He's alive. Oh. And he reigns forever and ever and ever and ever. Our God.
One last time, say, you are the reason. Wherever you are seated, why don't you turn? Just share a little bit of love with someone next to you, and then you can grab a seat. Once again, welcome to the Easter Sunrise at the Lincoln Memorial. Are you comfortable? You're good? Where, where are the, uh, we got the box seats right here. We got the bleacher seats, although you're up there by Lincoln. And uh, how are we doing over here today? We're doing all right. And what about over here? All right, well, let's do this thing. 2,000 years ago, the Roman Empire was the most powerful kingdom on the planet. It numbered 60 million people, one quarter of the planet's population. All roads led to Rome. At the peak of its power, Caesar Augustus, the same Caesar who declared that a census should be taken, declared himself Pontifex Maximus, or chief priest of Rome. He renovated 82 Roman temples. He reinstituted animal sacrifice to Roman gods. And it was upon his death in AD 14 that Caesar Augustus was declared the son of God. The inscription on Roman coins read, Caesar is Lord juxtapose that with this that same year AD 14 Jesus was a teenager living in a small town called Nazareth population 400 in an obscure outpost of the Roman Empire he never went to college he never wrote a book he never held elected office he didn't have a YouTube channel wasn't even on TikTok. In his teens and 20s, he worked as a craftsman. Then at age 30, he was baptized in the Jordan River by a man named John. He disappeared into the wilderness for 40 days. And when he came back, he started doing unbelievable miracles. He started telling unforgettable stories. But three years later, it was over. He was nailed to a Roman cross. And he had 12 disciples and 120 followers. And so let me ask you the question, if you were placing bets in the first century on Caesar's sports book, on what would last the longest, on who would have the greatest impact, Caesar or Jesus, Roman Empire or this thing we call Christianity, it's no contest. You bet the farm on Rome. 2,000 years have come and gone, and Caesar is a salad. I don't know anybody who worships Julius or Augustus or Marcus Aurelius, 
The Roman Empire is long gone. But 2,000 years later on this day, 2 billion people from every nation, tribe, people, and language will celebrate something we call Easter. How does that happen? How is it that history is divided into B.C. and A.D. by his birth. How is it that thousands of people got up at the crack of dawn, gathered at the Lincoln Memorial to declare that Jesus is Lord? The short answer, Christ is risen. If you have a Bible, you can meet me at the empty tomb, Matthew 28. We'll get there in a minute. How do you fall asleep after a day like that? When she closed her eyes, all she could see was his silhouette. A crown of thorns on his head, hands and feet nailed to a cross. But it was the look on his face that she would never forget. He wasn't angry. He wasn't scared. His face said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. His name was Jesus. Her name was Mary Magdalene, and it all happened so fast. He had gone to the garden to pray. Just after midnight, the religious leaders came with swords drawn. His friends deserted him. His enemies condemned him under the cover of night. The mob mocked him. Roman soldiers flogged him. And by noon, he was nailed to the cross. When Jesus gave up his spirit, so did Mary. All of her hopes and dreams were nailed to that cross that day. Her heart ached like a broken bone. Her mind raced like a jackrabbit. The only thing harder than falling asleep was waking up the next morning and realizing that it was real. But she knew what she had to do. And it would be the hardest thing that she had ever done. She would go to the grave to grieve all over again. And that's where we pick up the story in Matthew 28, verse 1. After the Sabbath, it dawned on the first day of the week. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb. There was a violent earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning. His clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid that they shook and became like dead men. Then the angel said to the women, fear not. Would you turn to your neighbor and say it like you believe it? Fear not. Fear not. For I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified, he is not here. He has risen just as he said. The title of the message this Easter is God's Grammar. You will forget most of what I say. I hope you remember this. Don't put a period where God puts a comma. Many years ago, when I started writing books, I attended the Story Seminar in New York City with legendary screenwriter Robert McKee. His students have won 63 Academy Awards, 164 Emmy Awards, and for two days we talked about narratology, the science of story structure. We talked about text and subtext. We talked about setup and payoff. We talked about inciting incidents, the defining moments in every story that flip the script. Can we have a little fun on Easter? Name that movie. Houston, we have a problem. Talk to me, Goose. You can't handle the truth. Show me the money. Luke, I am your father. 
those are inciting incidents. Those are the tipping points and turning points that change the trajectory of the story. I want you to hold that thought. The Bible is a big book. Actually, it's 66 books. It was written in three different languages on three different continents over a span of 1,500 years. Its human authors include farmers and fishermen, poets and prophets, doctors and tax collectors, and kings. It was written in palaces and in prison cells. It covers every subject under the sun. You've got history and prophecy. There are gospels and epistles. There's tragedy and comedy. There are musicals and documentaries and a few soap operas. All those subjects, all those years, all those authors, yet from Genesis to Revelation, it reads like one story. H how is that even possible? Because there is one author. The Bible is God-breathed. You don't just read the Bible. The Bible reads you. And it's as relevant today as it was 2,000 years ago. All of that to say this, the Bible is a big book. There is a lot of text, but there is one subtext. There is one setup, one payoff. There is one inciting incident that changed everything, and it is an empty tomb. I love the way Pastor Amos says it. Jesus entered our world through a door marked no entry, a virgin's womb, and Jesus left our world through a door marked no exit in empty tomb, from womb to tomb. This is the God who redefines what is possible. One of my earliest movie memories is the 1978 version of Superman starring Christopher Reeves. There is a scene where Lois Lane is driving through the Nevada desert, you remember this, and her car was swallowed by an earthquake. And I'm, I'm willing, I'll go, I'll go. Would that be better if I went handheld? Let's do it. Can you hear me now? Just kidding. We're waking up. Lois Lane is driving through the Nevada desert. Do you remember this? And her car is... Now, the science behind that scene is suspect. <laughs> because the earth is spinning at 1,000 miles an hour. And so if Superman had done what he did, he might have saved Lois Lane. The rest of us would have died of whiplash. Science aside, super cool concept. Come on, how many of us have said something, have done something that we wish we could unsay or undo? In the words of the theologian Cher, if I could turn back time, and out of respect for Sue Dodge, I'm going to stop right there. <laughs> Some things in life are irreversible. What's done is done. And I'll make it personal. I few, learned a few lessons the, the hard way. You cannot unrun a red light, I mean, especially the ones with the traffic cameras where they send you a picture in the mail. You, you cannot unbake cookies, set a timer. Uh, you cannot uncut hair. Once had, had a barber say, oops. And you cannot untear ligaments. I learned that lesson twice playing basketball in college. Some things in life are irre irreversible. What's done is done. Then along comes Jesus. 34 miracles recorded in the Gospels. Each one more amazing than the last. He turns water into wine. He feeds 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. He heals a man who hasn't walked in 38 days. He heals a man who was born blind. Then he says to a man four days dead, Lazarus, come forth. With each miracle, it's like God and Jesus is teaching God's 
grammar. Don't put a period where God puts a comma. Can I tell you today, it's not over until God says it's over. When we have a setback, we do not take a step back because God is preparing our comeback. Sometimes it seems like God is missing the mark, said Oswald Chambers, because we're too short-sighted to see what he's aiming for. Without a crucifixion, there is no resurrection. And that brings us back to Mary Magdalene in Matthew 28. Let me talk for two minutes about text and subtext. Jesus had 12 disciples, and those disciples did amazing things. All but one was martyred for their faith. But when Jesus was arrested, all of those disciples deserted him. Do you know who did not? The women. It was women who formed a hedge fund to support him financially. It, it was women who walked the Via Dolorosa. It was women who stood by him in the shadow of the cross. And it was women who were the first ones to the tomb. And it begs the question, why would these women risk their lives for a dead man? Here's my take. In a day and age when women were relegated to second-class status, no one honored women, no one empowered women like Jesus. And Mary Magdalene is exhibit A. Next to Mary, the mother of Jesus, no woman played a more significant role in the gospel story. Now, there are a lot of traditions and opinions, but one thing we know for sure Mary was once possessed by seven demons. She was broken in seven places. She was broken in seven pieces, but Jesus did what Jesus does. He put her back together. He healed her hurt. He restored her dignity, and he did what he does with us. He invites us into a bigger story, into a better story, and Mary will forever be the first eyewitness to the resurrection of Christ. The early church called her the apostle to the apostles. Put that on your LinkedIn profile. There is a Mary among us. And I don't know the specifics, but you're broken in seven places. I want you to hear two things today. One, the tomb is still empty. And two, Jesus is still putting broken hearts and broken bodies and broken minds and broken lives and broken marriages and broken promises and broken people back together again. Mary thought she was going to the grave to grieve, but that is when and where God shows up and shows off his power, his love, his grace, his goodness. We may give up on God, but there is a God who does not give up on us. We may lose faith, but there is a God who does not lose faith in us. There is a Mary among us. There is also a God who gives beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for mourning and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. There is a God who makes sidewalks through the seas. There is a God who says to the storm, peace be still. And there is a God who still says to people four days dead, Lazarus come forth. Today is your day. For the past 27 years, I've had the joy of pastoring National Community Church. And 1996 was our first Easter. 43 people showed up at a D.C. public school, and I was over the moon. Because that was twice as many people as we'd ever had. And so over the last 27 years, I have pastored every kind of person under the sun. Pastored every number on the Enneagram, every combination of letters on the Myers-Briggs. I've, I've pastored people you would clone if you could. Pastored a few EGR people, extra grace required. 
And it is my observation over all those years and all those different kinds of people that there are two kinds of Christian. And I, and I hope you hear my heart when I delineate the difference. There are two kinds of Christians. There are Good Friday Christians and there are Easter Sunday Christians. Now, Good Friday Christians believe in the power of of the cross. They know that their sin is forgiven and forgotten because of what Christ accomplished on the cross. That is where the ancient curse is broken. That, that is where the power of sin is canceled. How crazy that a cross, a device that was used by the Romans to torture people to death would become the symbol of life and love. The last thing I want to do on Easter Sunday is diminish the power of the cross. But here's the catch. Lots of people died on Roman crosses. According to archaeologists, about a thousand crucifixions per year in Judea in the first century. So Jesus crucified between two thieves was a normal day in the Roman Empire. Lots of people died on Roman crosses, but only one of them predicted their own death and resurrection and then pulled it off. It's the empty tomb that validates Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. But let's be honest, a lot of people still living like Jesus is still nailed to that cross. Can I tell you today that the only thing nailed to the cross is our sin? So praise God for Good Friday. Praise God for the cross of Christ. But we are an Easter people. When Jesus walked out of that tomb 2,000 years ago, all bets were off. All things were possible. Why? Because the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us. Let me close with a question. Are you living like the tomb is empty? In 2010, the Green Bay Packers won the NFC Championship. And a couple of minutes after the game, I tweeted that I would preach for tickets. <laughs> now, I was half joking, but a pastor in Texas took me up on it. And so I flew to Dallas with my youngest son, Josiah. And, and I preached that morning. We went to the game that night. And it coincided with his birthday. That's the kind of dad I am. <laughs> and so we're at the game, and it's awesome, but then I realize, what if they lose? And, and it was nerve-wracking in real time. There was a moment in the second half when the Steelers scored a touchdown, and my son started crying. <laughs> One of my proudest moments as a parent, train up a child in the way they should go. Well, the Packers won Super Bowl 45. We flew home the next day, and my wife had recorded the game. And so we, uh, I watched the entire game all over again the next day. Are you with me? Very different experience. Much more relaxing. Why? Because I knew the outcome because I knew the final score, because I knew who had won. Can we quit living as if the outcome is undecided? If the tomb is empty, let's live like it. We know the final score. We know who wins. Where, oh, death is your victory. Where, oh, death is your sting. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. You did not get up today because you are a Good Friday Christian. You got up because he got up. Would you get up on your feet today? Todd Delaney and the band's gonna come back. Can we just give God some praise one more time in this place, victorious, empty tomb. Christ is risen. Don't put a period where God puts a comma. In Jesus' name, amen.
I want to do one more thing today before we sing a final song. And here it is. I can't think of a better day to take a step of faith. I cannot think of a better place to start following this man named Jesus. I want to give you an opportunity to do that right here, right now, Easter 2023. I want to pray a prayer. And I think we pray it personally, but do you feel it today that we also pray it over this city humbly, but confidently, but boldly? And we pray it over this nation. And we pray it over every Mary among us and everyone in between. So I want to pray a prayer today. And maybe for the first time, maybe for the thousandth time, you want to pray this prayer with me. You can pray after me. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. And I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. And I surrender my life to the Lordship of Christ. Past, present, future. Time, talent, treasure. Heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I declare right here, right now, that God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer today for the first time, angels in heaven are rejoicing. And can I just be the first one to say, Welcome to the family. Come on, let's give God some more praise. Here we go.
One more time, say, because he Now raise up that sound, say, I can pay. Oh, don't hide those singing talents. Because he Let out the greatest roar, every believer. Come on, shake this place with your best praise. I mean, like football game, we just scored the winning touchdown roar. Not a patty cake, but I'm talking about Jesus is Lord, and we want the world to know about it. That thing right there. Let's hear it shout for the king. Come on, he didn't say, I am finished. He said, it is finished. And then he was just getting started, wasn't he? Come on, they held him high. They stretched him wide. And then they put him down low. He was there all day Friday, wasn't he? He was there all day Saturday. But Sunday early in the morning... I'm talking about how he got up early in the morning and he rose up and he gave the victory and he invited us into it. And so we give him praise today, don't we? Listen, two things here today. Number one, well, first we want to thank Todd Delaney and the band for leading us in worship today. In just a moment, Pastor Mark will come and give us the benediction, but two quick things. Number one, if you made a decision today to follow Jesus, we just want to encourage you today. In your program, there's that QR code. If you go there, uh, we want to get you some encouragement, some resources. And second, if you made that decision today, see right over here, lift up those signs, lift them up high. If you made a decision today, come up here, and we would love to connect with you. We've got some Bibles, we've got some resources, and we have some encouragement for you today. Take that step of faith, meet some of our team up here, and we'd love to connect with you. Number two, if you are down here in the seating area, if you could help us out by picking up your seat and bringing it to the back of the stage, that would be a huge blessing. And then Number three, uh, somebody left their passport card, and we found it. We got y'all, okay? It's going to be over here at the medical tent, okay? If that's you, make your way to the medical tent. Did we have a great time today? <laughs> Pastor Mark, come and close us out. Well, just take a moment and soak this moment in. It's almost hard to leave, and uh, but we're going to dismiss in just a moment. I, I want to say one more thing. There are thousands of people here today, but I want you to hear this. Every number has a name. Every name has a story, and every story matters to God. I hope today, even in a crowd this size, that you feel seen, heard, and loved by the Lord Jesus Christ and by us. Just so honored that 
we could spend this Easter together. A few final thanks. Thanks to Todd Delaney and the band for leading us today. Uh, thank you to those who pulled in all-nighter last night to pull this off. Um, I want to say a special thanks to Pastor Heather Zempel and to Pastor Travis Goodman. I, I want to say one more thank you for the vision and thank, and, and thank you for the faithfulness to Pastor Amos and Sue Dodge. And then finally... Give yourselves a hand. You got here today. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his countenance towards you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. God bless. Happy Easter.